Um, right, so today I'm going to be talking to you about my work on commensal protists in the gut microbiota and how they regulate the intestinal immune system. And so I think everyone here is already familiar with the concept of the gut microbiota and how important it is in regulating all sorts of aspects of host health and disease. But most work on the microbiota specifically focuses on the bacterial members of this community. But the microbiome is not just made up of bacteria. It also contains a lot of other organisms, including viruses, fungi, archaea, and protists. And protists in particular in the gut microbiota have been pretty much completely ignored. But very recently, it was found that these protists can actually have really dominant effects on the host immune response. And in particular, this work has been done using parabasilid protists, which are para, uh, protists in the parabasilia phylum. And most of the work has been done using a protist named Trichomonas musculus or T. musculus. And so T. musculus can actually have um, different immune responses depending on the region of the gut that it's colonizing. It causes type 2 immunity in the small intestine and type 1 and 17 immune responses in the colon. And these immune responses caused by T. musculus have dramatic impacts on the host susceptibility to both infectious and inflammatory diseases from things like colitis and colon cancer to worm infection. But when I was entering this uh, commensal protist field at the beginning of my postdoc, I was coming in as a microbiologist. And something I noticed was that pretty much all of the work in the commensal protist or commensal parabasilid field up to this point had focused exclusively on the host side of the host microbe interaction, which meant that the microbial side of the field was pretty much completely unexplored. And so coming in, there were sort of three main questions that I, as a microbiologist, was interested in addressing. And so these are the things that I've worked on during my postdoc, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on one of the vignettes from this story, which was how this protist actually integrates into the microbiome community. And so for this, I wanted to first understand what T. musculus was eating. And my initial hypothesis was that the protist would be eating dietary fiber because fiber is one of the most abundant uh, carbon sources for members of the microbiome community. And so these protists are not, were not culturable in vitro. And so in order to do this, I instead obtained mouse diets that had defined compositions of dietary fiber. And so the fibers that I used in these experiments and we'll use for the next few slides are diets that have either the fermentable fiber inulin, which can act as a carbon source for the microbiota, or the non-fermentable fiber cellulose, which cannot act as a carbon source for the microbiome. And so when I fed the mice a complex chow, which is just normal mouse house chow that you can find in the mouse facility, which has lots of different fibers, including inulin and cellulose, or a diet with inulin and cellulose, or just inulin alone, protist abundance was unaffected. The protists colonized mice just fine. But then when I starve the mice of fiber completely, or when I take away just fermentable fiber and give the mice only the non-fermentable fiber cellulose, protist abundance was dramatically reduced, indicating that T. musculus does use fermentable fiber as a carbon source. However, I also noticed that protist abundance didn't seem 100% depleted in the cellulose-fed mice indicating that there may be alternative substrates that the protists can grow on during a situation of fiber limitation. In order to understand what might be happening in that scenario, I obtained an, or I, I had an antibody developed against T. musculus so that I could look at the protists in situ. And so that's what we're looking at here, which is a colonic section of a T. musculus colonized mouse, where you can see the T. musculus cells in cyan. It's sort of distributed evenly throughout the lumen of the intestine, which is what we would expect for a fiber eating uh, organism because the fiber is in the lumen of the intestine. However, when I then put, checked the colon sections of mice fed the cellulose diet, so they're starved of fermentable fiber, we can actually see that there are a few T. musculus cells that survive fiber de deprivation, and all of those cells are very tightly co-localized to the mucus layer, suggesting that T. musculus may survive fiber deprivation by eating mucus glycans. However, in order to actually uh, sort of prove that T. musculus can grow on mucus glycans and eat that as a carbon source, it wasn't lost on me that the best way to do that would be to be able to culture the protist in vitro and grow it with mucus in an in vitro culture. But as I mentioned, these protists weren't culturable, but this is something that I've been working on throughout the entirety of my postdoc. And actually my postdoctoral advisor had been working on this during his postdoc as well. So there was a combined about eight years of work going into trying to culture these protists just in our lab. And 
around this time, I actually made a breakthrough in terms of figuring out how to culture T. musculus in azeanic in vitro culture and was now able to culture it uh, for very long term. I've now been able to grow it for six months continuously. And so this has opened up a lot of potential applications for mechanistic studies on these protists, which is really exciting. But then the first application I wanted to do was to figure out whether the protist can actually eat mucus. And so for that, I did growth curves on T. musculus with and without mucus, which seems like a pretty boring experiment because growth curves are not the most exciting microbiology uh, assay. But for us, this was pretty groundbreaking. And um, this showed that T. musculus is, in fact, able to grow on mucus when that's provided as the sole defined carbohydrate or uh, carbon source. But this result was also a little surprising because the protists grew a little too well in vitro when we gave them mucus. Because remember, they, the, the protists barely hang on by a thread in vivo, but here they seem to be growing just as well as the positive control. And so my hypothesis for what causes that discrepancy was that competition with, uh, with mucolytic bacteria was preventing the protists for, to grow efficiently in vivo. And so to test that hypothesis, I repeated my, uh, my, my fiber starvation experiments, but this time added a condition in which I fed the mice vancomycin, neomycin, and ampicillin, so an antibiotic kick cocktail, to knock out the bacterial component of the microbiota. And so what this showed, as you can see pretty clearly, is that the antibiotic cocktail completely rescued T. musculus colonization during fiber starvation. So then in order to figure out whether global depletion of bacteria is required or if specific groups of bacteria are outcompeting the protist, I parsed apart the antibiotics in my cocktail, which actually showed that vancomycin and neomycin were completely dispensable for rescuing T. musculus colonization, and ampicillin alone was 100% sufficient. And excitingly, T. musculus on the ampicillin-treated mice was tightly co-localized to the mucus layer, which is consistent with ampicillin sort of alleviating competitive pressure for that mucus niche. In order to then try to identify the bacteria that were outcompeting T. musculus for mucus, I then did 16S on those mice. And I'd like to just draw your attention to two of the different bacterial groups in this 16S data which are the bacteroidales, which are known generalists that can eat both fiber and mucus, and acromantia, which contains acromantia mucinophila, which is a known mucus eater. And as you can see, the bacteroidales or, and or acromantia are extremely abundant in each of the conditions in which T. musculus is depleted and are below the limit of detection only in the condition in which T. musculus is rescued with ampicillin treatment. So this highly suggests that bacteroidales and or acromantia compete, outcompete T. musculus for the mucus niche during fiber starvation. So I now wanted to then characterize the fiber eating ability of T. musculus. And for this, I decided to look at inulin because inulin specifically rescued T. musculus uh, colonization during, uh, it, during the in vivo setting. And so, I used my new in vitro culture capability to test whether or not this protist could eat inulin. And I was really surprised to actually see that the protist would not grow on inulin in in vitro culture. And so this was a really confusing result until I actually looked at the in, uh, protist localization in vivo again, which showed that on the inulin diet, the protists are actually not in the lumen of the intestine where we would expect them to be if they were eating the fiber. Instead, they were tightly co-localized to the mucus layer reminiscent of the pr protists in the fiber-starved mice. So this suggests that inulin is actually just allowing the protists to access the mucus niche. And so my model for how this is happening goes back to the bacteroidales and trans-kingdom interactions with bacteria. Because as I mentioned, bacteroidales are known generalists that can eat fiber and mucus. But what I didn't mention is that bacteroidales have been shown to preferentially eat fiber over mucus. And so my model for what's occurring is that the bacteroidales and T. musculus coexist when the mice are fed a complex diet, a, a diet with complex fibers because they eat different fibers. But then when we take away all fiber except for inulin, the bacteroidales are perfectly happy eating inulin, which frees up T, the mucus niche for T. musculus to occupy it. But then when I take away inulin as well, the bacteroidales also switch to eating mucus and outcompete the protist. And so this is something that I am, th this model is something that I'm working on proving now and is something I'm planning to do in my own lab. Um, but so far we have not been able to uh, prove it yet. And um, 
There's also a lot of other work that uh, went into the story and that is uh, going to be used to build off into my uh, into a lot of other different projects. Um, as I mentioned, this was just one vignette from the story. But if you're interested in learning more, um, I also discovered a new species of commensal protist and uh, found other trans kingdom interactions and then characterized how the protist diversity and trans kingdom interactions and diet affect protist induced immunity. And this work was just uh, published online in Cell last week, if you're interested in learning more. And so I'd just like to quickly thank everyone that's been involved in this project, especially my advisor, Mike Howitt, and um, my collaborators, both in the Howitt lab and uh, at Stanford in the Bot lab and Sonnenberg labs.